How are we feeling tonight? Cold? Yeah? I don't know about you, but I kind of like the rainy weather. It's kind of ice cream and ramen and pho kind of evenings, right? Maybe you guys might get some after this. I'm excited to be here. How, many, how about you? You excited to be here? Yeah? Praise God. You're here for Jesus, and all, that's all that matters. And so I'm excited. Uh, but it is a bittersweet night tonight because we are, in fact, concluding our series, The Moral of the Story, as we've been expounding and exploring the parables of Jesus. How many of us know that this has really led to a lot of fruitful discussions in small groups and discipleships? And so I am pretty sad that we're concluding it. But tonight we're going to go out with a bang because I got three parables that we're going to unpack tonight. Praise God. Pray for me. We got three parables that we're going to be talking about. And I assure you that all three of these parables really go hand in hand and they go back to back. And Jesus teaches really this common theme in all of these parables and that's an eschatological theme and that's just a big fancy word for the study of the end of the age Jesus's inevitable and imminent return where he will return he will make all things right all things new and all three of these parables that we're going to be unpacking tonight have two things in common and that is they present one promise and one problem the promise of these parables tell us that Jesus will return. It's not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And when he does, he will come to judge. He will separate the weeds from the wheat, the sheep from the goat, believers from non-believers. But for Christians, this is good news because he's coming to renew, redeem, resurrect, restore. No disease, no more destruction, no more death. Can I get an amen? None of that in new heaven and new earth that he will usher in when he returns. But the problem of these parables is simply that we don't know when he will return. Nobody knows when Jesus will return. So the point of these parables that we're going to be expounding tonight is not to get us to ponder when Christ will return. But Jesus tells these parables to get us to prepare for his return. Y'all ready for the word? This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, starting from verse 42. Jesus says, therefore, keep watch. Say, keep watch. Turn to your neighbor, tell him, watch out. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Here's the first parable. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. Say, kept watch. He would have kept watch and not let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man, Jesus, is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Parable number two, the parable of the faithful and wicked servant. Jesus asked the question, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good. Say good. Yeah, it'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, Jesus says, guarantee my dog. Truly, I tell you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Praise God. But suppose that servant is wicked. And he says to himself, my master is taking a long time or staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. Watch this. At an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, concluding with the last parable, which is the parable of the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids. Jesus says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like, speaking about his return in the future, will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom, who is Jesus, was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. But at midnight, there's the theme again, at an hour that they would not expect it, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. 
Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. And the wise ones replied, No. No. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready, say ready, they were ready, went in with him in the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the ones that came that didn't have oil, that went to go buy some, they came and they said, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And the way that Jesus started these parables is how he concludes it with the same instructions. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know the day nor the hour. Each of these parables that we just read give us some insight on how we ought to live our lives as we anticipate Jesus' return. And the three points is quite simple. Be watchful, be faithful, and be responsible. Say it with me. Be watchful, be faithful. And be responsible because the question is not whether Jesus will return. The question is, will we be ready when he does? So the title of my message today is, Ready or Not, Here He Comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we, we invite your spirit, God. It's going to take a lot of humility, a lot of grace to not just preach this word, but also to receive this word. And we thank you that this word is a lamp unto our feet that will lead us into eternity. And so, Father, guide us, direct us, and teach us how we ought to live our lives in preparation for that joyful and hopeful day of your return. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen. The first point in your notes is be watchful. Be watchful. Jesus tells the first parable, and he says, Therefore, keep watch, for you do not know the time or the hour that the Lord will come. And he gives the first parable by saying that, if the homeowner knew at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. So you also must be ready, say ready, because you do not know when the Son of Man will come. And in this parable, Jesus is likened to a thief. Not that he is, make no mistake, he's not a thief. But he is likened to a thief in a sense that thieves will always strike when you do not see it coming. Isn't that true? They come to seek to steal from you at an hour that you do not or least expect it. In the same way, Jesus will return and come as an unexpected guest. Now, I don't know about you, but the thought of having unexpected guests over to my house sometimes give me a little bit of anxiety. Because how many of us know that there is a difference sometimes with the house that you actually live in and the house that you invite people into? Yeah, anybody want to be honest in church today? I'm going to come for you. The house that you actually live in sometimes, if you, especially if you've got kids, is a house that has toys on the floor, right? If you've got a bunch of hungry teenagers, you might have a lot of dishes in your sink. If you're a single bachelor, maybe you're a college student in your dorm, you might have a sock or a bebedee lying around or two. If you've got pets, you might have fur all over the carpet or on the sofa that needs to be vacuumed. There is a difference sometimes with the house that we actually live in and the house that we expect guests to come over into. And what that tells us is that it is oftentimes expectation that precedes preparation. That when we are expecting guests to come over, we make the necessary preparations and take the necessary precautions to take care of things at home so that we can be ready for our expected guests. For those who are Christians and hope and expect in Jesus' return, ought to live in such a way similarly that we will live in a constant state of readiness and preparation because make no mistake we might not know when Jesus will return but by faith we believe that he will and those who are faithful and expect Jesus to come is naturally a faithful steward and responsible person that stewards their relationship with God because when Jesus returns best believe he's not coming back for a complacent church He's coming back for an expectant church because an expectant church is naturally a faithful church. 
And so Jesus gives the instruction in this parable to keep watch. Say keep watch. Keep watch. What does it require of us to keep watch? It requires two things. To be vigilant and to be diligent. To be vigilant requires us to be focused on the things of God. To be diligent means to steward our time here on earth well. Why? Because we do not know when he's returning. But there are two common reasons as to why we fail to be vigilant and diligent. Number one, we fail to stay focused on the things of God. Well, quite frankly, it's because we're distracted. We are distracted oftentimes by the desires of the flesh. We are, we, we are distracted by the things of this world. We ought to keep watch in wisdom of the things that we allow in our mind and in our heart. Why? Because our lives are constantly headed in the direction of our strongest thoughts and desires. And therefore, if we are not careful and we are distracted by the things of this world, taking our eyes off of Jesus, our attention is not undivided. It is divided between the world and the spirit. If we are not careful, our distractions will lead us to disobedience. Y'all with me? Yeah. Quiet in this place tonight, yeah? My question for you today is, what have you been distracted by that has caused you to take your eyes off of Jesus and the eternal prize in Christ? What have you been distracted by? We fail to be diligent with our times, with our time that we have simply because we're not just distracted, but we're also deceived. We're deceived. We are oftentimes very deceived into thinking that we have all the time in the world to do that which Christ has called us to do. We deceive ourselves into thinking that I have all the time in the world to do what God has called me to do. You know, one of the enemy's tactics is to use deception not just to get us to do the things that we should not do, but he uses deception to get us to not do the things that God calls us to do. And he uses this type of deception that leads us to procrastination. But brothers and sisters... Delayed obedience is still considered disobedience. Delayed obedience, amen, praise God. Delayed obedience is still considered disobedience. And if we're not careful, sometimes we pick up this bumbai mentality, yeah? Bumbai, I do them, you know what I mean? Bumbai, I go repent from my sin. I'll repent of my sin tomorrow. I'll trust in Jesus tomorrow. I'll evangelize and reach out to that person tomorrow. Are you sure about that? Because the Bible makes it clear, no one knows the day or the hour of the Lord's return. He could come at any minute, any second, any hour. So when is it a good time to choose to obey God? Probably now. <laughs> Probably now. Because truthfully, time is a luxury that no man can afford. Time is not a respecter of persons. And time is valuable. And we don't know when Jesus will return. I sense in the spirit that maybe some of us have an experience that breakthrough that we've been playing, praying for simply because we've been delayed in our obedience. That maybe we haven't seen that relationship that we've been praying for simply because we haven't learned how to steward our prioritization of our relationship with Jesus first. Maybe we haven't seen God provide in the area of our finances because we've been delayed in trusting him with a tithe. Maybe, just maybe, God hasn't set you free from your anger and your bitterness simply because you have not chosen to forgive. As some of our breakthroughs that we're praying for is actually a result of our delayed obedience. I remember one time when I first got saved, I was in this healing journey of everything that had happened to me as a child. And I remember my small group leader, I was talking with him. And at the end of it, I knew what was coming. I knew he was going to tell me, forgive. And I was like, shut up, you know. And, um, but he told me to forget. But because I respected him, I said, I understand, bro. I, I will. And then I told him, I'll pray about it. And you know what he said to me? Pray about it. He said, yeah, I'll pray about it. And he said, pray about what? And I said, well, I pray about when I'm going to forgive. I said, I'm going to pray when I forgive. He said, you know, this is what he taught me. This is good discipleship right here. Listen up. He said that that which is already concrete in Scripture requires no more confirmation. <laughs> that some things really don't require intercessory prayer. They just require immediate obedience. There's just some things like pray for the grace to forgive, pray, pray, pray without ceasing, but you don't need any more confirmation to do that which Christ has called you to do now. I ain't talking about those things that, you know, God give me the things of my flesh. I'm talking about the things that you wrestle with that you delay. 
Those are the things. So when should you obey? Now. When should you repent? Now. When should you trust in Jesus? When should you start repenting of your sin or evangelizing to that person? Any second, any minute, any hour is a great opportunity and time to obey and walk faithfully with the Lord. Any time. Because brothers and sisters, the truth is we are running out of time. We are running out of time. And that's not designed or mentioned so that you can have anxiety, but it should raise a level of urgency to live in obedience and eradicate all levels of complacency that prevent us from walking in faithfulness and readiness to God and His Word. The point of this parable is to stop procrastinating and start preparing. Because Jesus is coming and that's why the apostle paul says in ephesians chapter 5 look carefully there's the language again keep watch look carefully then at how you walk not as unwise but wise making the best use of your time because the days are evil and he says don't be foolish turn to your neighbor stop acting a fool tell him stop acting a fool don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is for your life. So what is the will of the Lord for our lives? What shall we do while we wait on God? Well, I would suggest to you that we do exactly what waiters do in restaurants. We serve. That is the next reason why in the very next verse, Jesus transitions and he talks about the parable of the two servants. One is wicked, one is faithful. Both were given the responsibility while their master was gone, a.k.a. Jesus, gave the two servants a responsibility to serve and to feed the people in his household. They had one job. Say one job. The parable then goes on where the next point is to be faithful. Be faithful. The parable then goes on. Jesus asks the question, who then is the faithful and wise servant? I'm going to ask that question. I want you to say, I am. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? That's right. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge? Look at that. Put in charge of the servants of his household to feed them at the proper time. Notice the language that Jesus used for the faithful servant. He says he was put in charge, which means that he was given a leadership role. Because how many of us know in the kingdom, leadership is serving? You would think that the servants would be feeding the leader, but in this parable, the leader is responsible for feeding the other servants. This is an upside-down kingdom. So he was given a responsibility to feed. Now watch this now. This is exactly what Jesus calls us to do. If you are a Christian who confesses that Jesus is your Lord, when you became a new creation, you got a new occupation. You are now put in charge by the great commission and the great commandment, which is to love God, love people, and make disciples. Love God, love people, make disciples. And we have all been put in charge to steward our relationships with the people that God has placed in our proximity. Make no mistake, you're not just simply on that college campus for you to just learn more. You're there to also teach people about who Jesus is. You're not just on that marketplace or in the workplace simply, simply so that you can just make money. You're there so that you can also make disciples in the process. You're not just on that sports team simply for you to just win games. You're there to win people over to Jesus. This is the universal purpose of every single Christian. The universal purpose of what Christ calls us to do. By the way, isn't Jesus the prime example of what it means to be a faithful servant? Isn't our aim as Christians and disciples to be more like Jesus? You know what we say when we say we want to be more like Jesus? Make me more of a faithful servant. Less of me, more of you. That's what we're singing. Was Jesus not the one that left the place of glory to dwell amongst this fallen and broken world to live the life we should have lived? To die the death that we should have died in our place so that when he rose from the dead, you and I too can be risen in glory with him? Isn't Jesus the example of the faithful servant? And one thing that I love is that because Jesus humbled himself as a suffering servant for our salvation, 
Because he humbled himself, the Bible says that he was lifted up in glory. So when he invites us to participate in his great commission, he is inviting us too to experience the glory and the provision and the protection and the, and the rewards that come with it. You see, faithful servants understand one thing. Faithful servants understand that we're willing to get down in order to lift people up. Faithful servants understand that it's not about self-promotion, it's about self-denial and self-sacrifice. And faithful servants don't serve for an audience of many, they serve for an audience of one, and that's Jesus. Ain't it interesting how the passage says that while the master was gone, he was found doing what he was supposed to be doing? See, we ought to be this way, especially in this year of an election year. I'm not here to talk about politics, but I'm here to talk about what Christ calls us, our king tells us and requires us to do that when everyone else wants to be divided and hate on one another when everyone else wants to serve themselves and be entitled to their opinion at the expense of their relationship with God oftentimes we need to understand that we're called to be set apart we're not called to be like the rest of the world so we need to understand that even when everyone else is doing the exact exact opposite serving themselves only thinking about themselves you and I who are true believers in Christ are called to be set apart. That when no one else is looking, no one else is watching, even when you don't get the recognition because we ultimately know that we serve for an audience of one and his name is Jesus. And right after this, the parable then goes on. Jesus says, truly guarantee my dog, I will put him in charge of all my possessions. That the reward was great for somebody that prioritized his great commission and great commandment. And so therefore, when we choose to prioritize his great commission and great commandment, the promise of scripture, this is not a promise from the pulpit. This is a promise from God's word that when we prioritize his mission, protection, provision, and promotion is inevitable. Don't you want to experience that? Is there anybody in the house today that gets excited about that? I want to experience the blessing of God, but it often comes with me aligning myself to God's mission and God's word. And it starts by caring for the people that you are in proximity with. So let's talk about the wicked servant. Both were given the same exact responsibility. And the Bible says that, but suppose that wicked servant, that wicked servant says to himself, watch that now, he says to himself, Ah, my master's taking a long time to come back. My master's taking a long time to come back. What comes out of our mouth reveals what's in our heart. And what was in his heart and what came out of his mouth revealed that he had no fear of the Lord. He had no reverence for his master. No respect or no love for the master that gave him a place in his household. And that lack of reverence led him to disobedience. Now, one thing that we need to understand is that he started to take advantage of the time, the resources, and everything that God blessed or the master blessed him with. He took advantage of the grace and the mercy of his master. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is what it looks like when we say things well like, you know, master's taking on Jesus is not coming back anytime soon. I'm going to just live how I want. I'm going to just keep on sinning and, and doing whatever my flesh desires. Because how many of us know that we're more susceptible to live in the flesh when there is no fear of the Lord? We are more susceptible to live selfishly in our flesh because the truth is we're all serving something. We're either serving God or we're serving ourselves. And so he begins with this lack of reverence for his master. Let me explain one thing as it relates to the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord does not mean that you're scared of his punishment. That's not biblical fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is understanding and being afraid of doing life without Jesus. See, it is the love of Jesus that draws us into relationship with him, but it is a fear of God that keeps us. Let me just testify. Apart from Jesus, I'm an addict. I'm a broken man. Without Jesus in my life, depressed, anxious. And I'm afraid of going back. And that is the fear of the Lord that keeps us. That's why the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One leads to righteous judgment. And of course, because he did not have any fear of his master, all he wanted was autonomy and not accountability. 
he minimized God's judgment, but he maximized the grace of God. It led him to this path of what doing next? Beating his fellow servants. Ain't that interesting? The very people that he was assigned to care for, he ended up beating up. The people that he was assigned to feed and to nurture and to care for and serve, he ended up beating up. My question for you today is how do we treat the people on your campuses? How do we treat the people in our homes? How do we treat the people that we disagree with? How do we treat others? Because remember, this is all about how we steward our relationship and the Great Commission and Great Commandment. So he started to beat the very people that he was assigned to care for. That's interesting. And the Bible says that he then began to eat and drink with drunkards. Remember what his job was. His job was to feed, but instead he's eating. He, instead of feeding, he's eating. And he's eating that which he's supposed to be giving out to others. Brothers and sisters, hear me. This is what it looks like when we want to eat of God's grace, but we don't want to give grace to other people. When we want to love, God, I want your love, but I'm not really down to feed your love to other people. God, I want you to serve and provide for me, but I don't want to provide and serve others and be generous to others. And brothers and sisters, hear me. To receive something from God, but fail to reciprocate it and replicate it in the context of your relationships is borderline hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. First John says that if someone claims with their lips to love God and yet hates a brother or a sister, that person is a liar and the love of God is not in them. Truthfully, this is why many people, myself included, may have a hard time, that we're around, may have a hard time believing in God because there are a lot of wicked servants at times, like myself, that are misrepresenting the master that they claim to serve. And quite frankly, this is actually, Barna did a study about this. You might be interested about this. That 86% of self-proclaimed atheists credit their unbelief, not to biblical truth. They credit their unbelief to hypocrisy of Christians. That's a sobering fact. And that is why the punishment is severe for this wicked servant. The Bible then says that when the master came, when he did not expect it because he was living selfishly, the Bible says that he caught him doing what he wasn't supposed to be doing and at his return, he cut him into pieces and assigned him a place, watch this, with the hypocrites. He received his due just judgment. Why is Jesus so, so severe with this? Because brothers and sisters, this is how much God really cares about our relationships with others. He cares about how we love, how we serve, how we give. And this is not God's heart that we would experience this punishment and judgment. And this is a call to repentance to make sure that we are aligning ourselves with God's heart for our relationships, even for the people that we cannot stand sometimes. Because this relationship with God is not just vertical, it's horizontal. It's about how we treat the people around us. Do I act in a way that draws people closer to Jesus or pushes people away from Jesus? That's the question. Because at the end, when we face Jesus on Judgment Day, we will be held accountable, as we talked about in the first point, for our time and our relationships. Third thing in your notes is the last parable, which is to be responsible say be responsible be responsible that sounded very irresponsible the way that you said it say it again be responsible y'all still with me right Jesus says in the next parable of the ten virgins talks about it. I'm just going to summarize it for the sake of time Jesus talks about this parable of a bridegroom coming for his bride aka Jesus coming for his church What's interesting about this passage, you have to understand Jewish context, cultural context, is that there would be a processional or a betrothal that would happen. It's a proposal. And so what would happen was with the parents or the two fathers of the bride and the groom, they'd come with a mutual agreement. 
And that is kind of like an arranged marriage. That's just how it was back in the day. They would come to an agreement representing our covenant with God. And with this covenant, it would take some time where the groom would actually go back to his hometown to begin to build a home for his family or for his wife and his future family. So when the, bride, when the groom would go back to his home and prepare a place, doesn't that sound like what Jesus is doing for us? That he goes to heaven to prepare a place for us when he ascended into heaven. And the promise is that eventually that bridegroom, that groom would come to receive his bride. And this could take a year. It could take a couple months. Nobody really knew when it was. But the Bible or this parable emphasizes and focuses on the ten bridesmaids. The ten virgins, they're bridesmaids really. That's what they really were. And this bride, the ten bridesmaids were given, listen up, a responsibility. They were given one job. Say one job. They had one job. And that was simply to have their lamps ready because what their responsibility was, was to light the way that when the bridegroom comes to receive his bride, those bridesmaids would light up their lamps and bring the rest of the processional and the party with them. And it was ultimately their lamps that actually set them apart from the rest of the party. If you did not have a lamp, sorry, you weren't invited. So it was their lamps that set them apart. But what we see in this parable is the foolish and the wise bridesmaids, which reveals that 10 of the bridesmaids, or five of them were foolish, five of them were wise, 10 of them were dressed for the part, but only five of them were ready to play their part. Only five were ready to play their part. Five of them took extra jars of oil with them. The five didn't bring any oil at all. So they had the lamps, they had no oil. So they were dressed apart, but not ready to play their part. This is kind of what it looks like when Christians, and I'm not above this, I'm with you. This is what it looks like when Christians want the benefits of salvation but don't want to have anything to do with sanctification. This is what it looks like between real believers and make believers. That is the point of this parable. Real believers and make believers. Make believers are typically people that want to embrace church culture but don't want to embody Christ like character out there in the world. Where it's all about my happiness, but holiness, nah, not for me. The distinguishing factor between real believers and make-believers was the oil that was in their lamps. The oil is what set them apart. In Scripture, oil is symbolic and representative of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them were given lamps, which meant that, which meant that they were invited to the party. They had lamps like you and I, we have lamps, we have lives. The question is not whether or not you have a lamp. The question is, are you filled with His Spirit? Are you filled with His oil? Because truthfully, the lamp is absolutely useless, right? Without any oil. In the same way, our lives are utterly useless at the end if we are not walking and filled with His Holy Spirit and having a personal relationship with Jesus. And this is the thing about these lamps, if you saw that picture, it required constant filling because they would eventually burn out. It required constant soaking, a constant filling. And the foolish, the foolish ones had no extra oil, the wise ones did. It required constant filling. How do we fill our lives with more of Jesus? How do we foster a personal relationship with God? Obviously through moments of discipleship, right? Devotional time with Jesus, in the Word, showing up to church on Sunday, worshiping God on your own personal time. These are all avenues in which we can continue to soak and foster our personal relationship with Jesus. Now hear me, this is not a bunch of religious duties. These are all relational responsibilities. The point of this parable is to reveal that we are all personally responsible for our own personal relationship with Jesus. That is the point of this parable. And the crazy part about this is that the Bible doesn't explicitly, it's coming to mind, the Bible doesn't explicitly say why they didn't have oil on them. 
But I think that that might be up for personal interpretation, isn't it? Because they could have had a litany of excuses as to why they weren't being filled, why they were not soaked, why they were not fostering a relationship with Jesus. Kind of like how we come up with excuses, right? Anybody want to be honest in church today? I don't want to. Yeah, thank you for raising your hand. I don't want to go to a group. Why? Because I'm not going through stuff right now. Right? I don't want to go to church. Why? Because football Sunday, my dog. Well, guess what? We got Friday night services, so football season's coming up, baby. There's a litany of excuses that we can come up with to not cultivate and foster a real, genuine, personal relationship with Jesus. A litany of excuses. And then we wonder why, right? We wonder why oh, I feel burnt out. My relationship with Jesus feels dry. And then when things happen that are unfavorable, which they will, then we question God, right? God, where were you? No, the question is, where were we? See, the failure of these foolish bridesmaids was simply that they were reactive instead of proactive. And then the Bible says that the groom came, right? At midnight, the cry ran out, rang out. The bridegroom is here. He's here, he's here. And everyone starts to try to prepare and then the foolish ones have the audacity to ask the wise ones, hey, give me some of your oil, dog. Give me some of your oil, but I'm running out because, oh, no, he's coming. You ever heard of an Aku bird, by the way? You know what is an Aku bird? Aku bird is the guy that comes to the barbecue. He eat everything on the table, but he don't bring nothing on the table. You know what, I, you know what I'm talking about, yeah? Those guys, if that's you, elbow your neighbor, yeah? But they tried to be an Aku bird, and they said, give me some of your oil. Our lamps are going out, and the wise one in their wisdom said, no. No. Go get your own. Really, that's what they said. Go get your own. He said, instead, go buy some for yourselves. Go get it from the source. Now, you might be thinking, well, Jarek, you just preached on being a faithful servant, right? Aren't we supposed to give? Aren't we supposed to do this and that? Yeah, but the point of this parable is to reveal that it's our personal responsibility to steward our relationship with God. So one thing that I love about these wise servants is they still, though they said no, they said no, go get some for yourself. Let me tell you about where you can get it. In the same way, you and I as faithful servants can be a living, demonstrating example of what it means to live a life faithful to Jesus, be generous to serve faithfully to others, but at the end of the day, the saved cannot be the Savior. As much as I love my family, I cannot save my family. That at the end of the day, Every single one of us will stand on judgment day between just us and God, and it'll be, nobody's going to be standing with us. It's a personal relationship with Jesus that Jesus is trying to make clear. Steward your relationship with God. Trust in him now. Sometimes we treat our relationship with Jesus like Costco memberships, right? Like Costco membership. You know how you can just flash your card, yeah? You can't do that anymore, though. I don't know if you got the news, but... We treat it like, like Costco membership cards where, where we, we, we think that, oh, my, my parents were saved. My grandmama was praying for me. My small group has been praying for me. At the end of the day, you won't be able to fool God because you need your own membership. There's no family plans. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no family plans in the kingdom of God. That if you did not personally trust in Jesus yourself, you're not getting into Costco, I mean, the kingdom. the truth i know that's sobering but it's the truth we treat it like credit cards yeah like like oh you get can co-sign to someone's credit line so that you can build your credit you cannot use someone else's co-signing to build your credit with god the debt that we owe to jesus is too great there's only one person that lived a perfected life that has perfect credit with the father and if we are not co-signed by the blood of jesus and the cross of jesus through a personal relationship with him we are not getting into the kingdom of god A sense of the spirit right now too. I just got to say this. When I talked about hypocrisy, I saw some of your faces and I understand that maybe you've been hurt by Christians and I just want to say on behalf of Christians, I'm sorry. We're sorry. But I, can I just urge you, don't let imperfection, stupid Christians like me sometimes stop you from putting your trust in a faithful and perfect God. We're going to fail you. I'm going to fail you. Everyone's going to fail us, but there's only one perfect God. 
And here's the truth. When we stand on judgment day, we will not be able to point fingers. We will not be able to point fingers. It's down to a personal choice of saying, I'm going to choose to trust in Jesus for myself. And the parable concludes by saying that the woes that were ready with oil went into the wedding banquet with the bridegroom. The five of them went to go buy oil. The Bible says that when they went inside, the door was already shut. It was too late. The door was shut and they come And they say, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Let me in, let me in, right? Jesus, I thought I had more time. I was deceived. I thought I had more time. I was distracted. I didn't put my trust in you, and it's already too late. The door is shut. Can you imagine? Could you just imagine for a moment with me what that must have felt like to get there? To see that it was already too late? Could you also imagine how much it broke Jesus' heart to say those words, I don't know you? Oh, Jesus, of course you know me. I sat in the front row of church. I volunteered at the food bank. God, you know me, right? He says, truly, I don't know you. Jesus said that many will say that I casted out demons and prophesied in your name. I did all of these great things. Cross the, D, the T's, dot the I's, you name it, I did it. And Jesus responded to them in the same way, truly, I don't know you. And that no one will get into the kingdom of heaven unless they do the will of the Father. Well, isn't that the will of the Father to serve, to do, do, do? No. The will of the Father is to have a personal relationship with you. That those who do the will of the Father by putting their trust in Jesus, those are the ones that will inherit the kingdom of God. And hear me, brothers and sisters, when Jesus says, I don't know you, what that means, epigonosco, with knowing, what that means is it means a shared experience, an experiential knowledge of Jesus through shared experience. Do you walk with Jesus daily? This is not a condemnation. This is a call to repentance. Do you walk with Jesus daily? Do you know him and does he know you? And hear me. Listen up, hear me. Every second that passes by is Jesus simply knocking on the door of our hearts. And he's the one right now saying, let me in. And God is patient. That's the revelation. God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. He is patient for sure, but He's also faithful to His promise that He will return and that we will face Him one day. So while He knocks, we can either choose to open the door and let Him into our heart now, or as the parable teaches, we will be the ones knocking at the end. And it will already be too late. So the question isn't whether or not Jesus is coming back. The question is, what side of the door will you be standing on? And hear me. This is not a get out of hell free card. That's not the motivation to give your life to Jesus. If you're tired, if you're weary, if you're broken, if you're tired of living in your sin, you're tired of being captured by your shame, if you're tired of running around in circles, hurting yourself and hurting other people, Jesus knocks on the door of your heart this evening and he says, let me in. Let me in. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, while the door is still open, walk into it. So with every head bowed and eyes closed in this moment, a moment of focus and reverence. I understand that a message like this is, can get us to question, am I really walking with Jesus? 
Am I really walking with Jesus? And maybe you're new here today and, and you don't even know what it's like to live a life with Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity now, a moment of repentance, changing your mind and inviting the Holy Spirit and Christ into your heart as your Lord and your Savior. And you don't need to get your act together. You don't need to get everything together and fixed up and patched up. That's what Jesus comes in your heart to do. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When you let Jesus in, you let peace in. When you let Jesus in, you let healing in. When you let Jesus in, all anxiety cease. There's freedom when you let Jesus in. So I'm going to count of three. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus and you want him to come into your heart, and you, don't, and you don't have a confidence that if you were to die today or if Jesus were to return, you don't know where you would go. I want to give you an opportunity for you to place your trust in Jesus to receive the assurance of eternity. On the count of three, go ahead and lift up your hands. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. Keep them up. Keep them up. Hi. The Father says that those who acknowledge me in public, he will acknowledge before the Father. Thank you, Lord. I want you to repeat this prayer after me as we as a church will repeat this after you. And it says, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. I invite you into my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died for my sin conquering my sin conquering my shame and I believe that you rose on the third day come into my heart have all of me Father I thank you Lord for all of these people God that chose to respond to the invitation Father we pray right now in the name of Jesus that this would not be an emotional decision but this would lead to discipleship we pray, God, that as you walk with us, we thank you that you're patient. We thank you, God, that we don't need to have everything together. We come to you simply as you are, but God, we ask that you would change our hearts. We don't want to live like the wicked servant for ourselves where it's all about us, all about me. But God, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the heart and the grace that by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit to conquer our addictions, to conquer our bitterness, to conquer our unforgiveness. Father, right now, Lord, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit, reveal your love to them. Reveal yourself, Lord. The deepest depths of their heart that they are ashamed to talk about, God, I pray that you would encourage them. You would let them know that they are sons, they are daughters, that they are not forsaken, that they are held in the hand of a loving Father, God. So we pray, Lord, that your spirit would lift them up, that they would be inspired and encouraged, God, to keep fighting the good fight of faith. And we pray, Lord, that you would unleash the plans and the purposes that go way beyond what they can imagine or think for themselves. And we thank you that you are a holy God. We thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen.